Hi, and welcome to today's session of Lunches with Legends, where we connect with some of the most illustrious business leaders in the world while supporting vital healthcare organizations in our communities. Before we begin, I'd just like to thank our key sponsors of this series, especially our gold sponsor, Franklin Templeton. Uh, we are deeply grateful for your friendship and very generous support. We would also like to thank our lead, uh, other lead sponsors, which include RPIA, Ventera Realty, Krugan McConnell Group, TD Bank, KPMG, and Merit Asset Management. We really do appreciate your generosity. I wanted to remind everyone that 100% of the dollars you donate through Lunches with Legends goes to pediatric mental health in our community. Um, and really a special thanks to the Shandaria family who helped organize this session. And as a result of all their efforts, today's proceeds will be directed towards uh, Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. So if you haven't yet made your donation, please take a moment, go to the donation page on the site. We'd so uh, appreciate your support. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our very special guest today, uh, Mr. Ambassador Dominic Barton. Uh, prior to being appointed as Canada's ambassador to the People's Republic of China, Dominic was the global managing partner of McKinsey and Company. His previous roles have included serving as the chairman of tech resources and directorships in various globally recognized businesses. Aside from his extraordinary business pedigree, uh, Dominic's civic and philanthropic leadership has been uh, equally legendary. He has led, advised, built, and supported more organizations than time will allow us to enumerate, but uh, some of them include serving as the chairman of Canada's Advisory Council on Economic Growth, chair of Seoul's International Business Advisory Council, chancellor of the University of Waterloo, and all while serving on the boards of at least a half a dozen other organizations. Dominic has also co-authored four books and over 40, uh, over, I'm sorry, 80 articles on topics related to financial management and leadership. He is an adjunct professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing and the recipient of eight honorary doctorates, including uh, ones from University of Toronto, University of British Columbia, and University of Edinburgh. And his uh, original degrees emanating from University of British Columbia and Oxford University, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. It, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the one and only uh, Ambassador Dominic Barton. Dominic, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Mo, for having me. And it's uh, an honor to be with all of you. Uh, I, I hope the audio and the communication's okay. I'm in, I'm in a remote part of China, so forgive me if I, I look even weirder than I normally do or I'm frozen, <laughs> but it's great to be on your show. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So maybe just before we get started, you know, after reading this extraordinary bio of yours, I really can't help but wonder how someone who came some, from such humble beginnings as a small town in, in BC emerged to become one of the few people in his town to go to university and then much less become a Rhodes Scholar that plays hockey and then much less to lead the most prestigious consulting firm in the world. So as you reflect on your childhood, do you recall what may have been some of the more formative experience that naturally helped you emerge uh, as the person you are today? I'm, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned hockey because I'm, I'm, I'm a useless hockey player, but I, I was able to play because no one else could, if you could stand up on skates, you could play on the university team. So I, I was excited. <laughs> so I'm glad, thank you for doing that, but I'll leave it at that. But I, no, I, I think the, um, you know, if, if I think back, especially my time, I was at, in Sardis, which is kind of like a suburb of Chilliwack, which is in the Fraser Valley in British Columbia. It's, re it's really teachers. There were, there were two teachers that kind of helped, you know, you know, pushed me to try and do, you know, be more ambitious to be able to take risk and do things. It was really two, two teachers in particular that just uh, for some reason took me under their wing and gave me confidence. And I, I, I to this day, I'm great, eternally grateful uh, for them. Um, and I, I think it, there's a general theme, which is really, I think, mentors. I mean, whenever I'm in a meeting, I think of, I've got sort of 100 people on each shoulder who've, who have helped me or guided me in different ways. So it's really teachers and mentors, I, I think, have been, who've helped, especially when things are tough, right. um, that, that are key. 
Yeah. And so, I mean, the mentor theme is sort of a good segue to your role um, at leading McKinsey. And again, a partner leading peers, you know, in the CEO role. And you came in in a fairly, uh, after a tumultuous period, and there was all kinds of scandals around Rajat Gupta and Enron and some of the growing pains of expansion. How much did the experience of kind of cleaning up that mess inform your book on managing crises? And, and what were some of the uh, personal learnings and transformative experiences that you took from that period? Yeah, the, uh, you know, I, 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 trying to think where to start on that because for, first of all I you know obviously I think with crises you're not expecting them so it was the it was I when, when I took on the role we were just it, sort of in the uh, early stages of the of the 2008 2009 financial crisis and you know I thought McKinsey when things are very good or things are very bad people need us it turns out when things are very bad people don't have money to actually work with us and so it was <laughs> We, 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 we had some serious economic challenges. And just as those were, we were sort of getting through that, we had this major scandal, as you, as you mentioned, a sort of insider trading. You know, when you think it's a firm that's based on trust, that was pretty shattering. And, and um, I think that what, what, you know, what I learned from that is you have to lean into the crisis, if you will, if there's a problem, because you know, the tendency is to hope it goes away, or hope it's not as bad as you as it is, or that somehow people will forget about it, or, or they won't talk about it or whatever. And that's not the case. And you've got to, you've got to embrace it, you've almost got to hug, hug the, <laughs> hug the crisis and, and make it your focus. And the odd thing when I say this is I, I then I had, I, and I think, every leader is going to have multiple crises. I had other crises, which I think I handled badly. Even though I learned from this, I didn't take some of those lessons. I mean, what one is around South Africa, you know, it was toward the end of my term. And it was, I didn't feel it was just the kind of issues we were being put, you know, that were being put on the table for us. And, but I think I, I didn't take some of those lessons that I learned in the first couple of years, which is just to totally embrace it. I, I probably should have moved down to South Africa at the time and, and being very open, you know, you, so that for me, it was that kind of, you've got to lean right into it, um, own it. Uh, don't listen to the lawyers uh, who will tell you all sorts of reasons why you need to be careful. And, and again, it's, they come from a good place. I don't, I love lawyers. I'm not trying, but it's more, you, you got to, you got to do it. And what I would do, this is a minor thing, like recruiting is obviously a really, really important part to McKinsey. It's actually probably more important, I would say, than actually the client work. You have to have good people to be able to do anything. That The people come before the client work, if you will. And, and that was a very difficult... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead, Dominic. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. Uh, I, I guess it's really even more remote than I thought. But... Uh, <laughs> Apologies for this. Hopefully, again, Mo, you can hear me okay? You can hear me just fine, just fine. Okay, good. Yeah, so what I was just saying on the crisis question was, you know, in recruiting, which was a, it, it was that kind of embarrassing, if you will, but you mm -hmm. had to kind of, you just have to raise the issue up front in everywhere that you go because people know about it. And that it, it's, uh, you know, think it's embarrassing, if, if you will. It's humiliating. And, but again, you just got to embrace it. And I, and I think the, the problem or one of the challenges in leadership is there's just going to, there, there will be, you know, there, there, there will be many crises that um, you need to deal with. So it's a, it's a skill I think that one needs to have. And it's one I'm trying, I'm still trying to learn honestly mm -hmm. how to how to do it. Well, uh, the, um, and there's times when I think I can do it well, and there's times when I completely flop, yeah. but it's a really, it, it's a key muscle. So, you know, um, Again, we won't talk about technological crises that we all experience. Um, but <laughs> the, the uh, so let's actually turn the attention to uh, the success side of the equation. You know, you, you've worked with some of the largest companies and governments, and you, you've been surrounded by the most successful people in the world. In that construct, again, I'm, I'm actually quite curious. How how do you define success, and how do you define how did you define it with your clients, with McKinsey, and and what does success mean to you today? 
you know, I, I, just one word comes to mind, which is impact. You know what I mean? The, and I think it's very important to differentiate between activity and impact. There, there's a lot of activity often in organizations or in one's day, but at the end of the day, what impact or influence are you actually having? And I think it's very important to, to be crystal clear about what impact means to you. Um, that That's, you know, I, I've tried again as a slow learner, but, you know, I, I have kind of a, in a role that you're in, like, for example, you know, when I was a, the managing partner, I would have a role, you know, I would have a set of, you know, uh, goals, right, which is really around mm -hmm. amp impact that I wanted to have. It was kind of like five things. In this role, as a in my current role as a ambassador to China, I have there's five priorities that I'm focused on, and it's very important to keep remind yourself of that uh, at least weekly because you can just get completely distracted with activity. So right. I'm even getting too much into the kind of mechanics, but I think impact is sh it's it's around leadership. There's a d difference between leadership and management. Ma management is is kind of running a place as it is. And I think in a world that's changing in a place where I think, you know, um, you need, you need to be thinking about reallocating resources or innovating um, or taking a place to a different, you know, di a, a different spot. You, that's leadership and um, leadership's on top of management. And that's again, where I would sort of have that I'm sort of focus on impact. I don't, I don't know if that's making any sense or not. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that's kind of how I see it. So let, let's, let's turn to your role in the, as, as uh, Canada's ambassador to China. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what do most people misunderstand about China? Like can someone, for example, can someone deal with the Chinese people without dealing with the Chinese government? Um, but I think more broadly, what do you think that we misunderstand about the, uh, the, the China um, and U.S. relationship, the China and the West relationship, and, and how do we actually interact with them going forward? Well, I, I think that there's actually, um, you know, in a sense, too much misunderstandings that are going on in the world today with all of the shifts. And I, if I take the sort of our understanding of China, I think one thing that we tend to do is treat China as a monolith, right? It's China. Um, I probably could do a Trump imitation, but I'm not very good at that. You know, this kind of a, it's, it's, it's one block, right? You know, China is an incredibly diverse regionally, uh, you know, a country, um, very, you know, totally interestingly different ways of things in terms of how things get done it's there's different levels of leadership there's a central government there's provincial governments there's you know um local governments there's you know i'm a county level like there's there's so many different levels and then there's the people as you said you know that and people are people are people you know what i mean and different and, and i think it's difficult it, we should just be careful about labeling people now clearly there are a lot there are commonalities but i think the biggest, I think, problem that we face is we tend to treat China as a monolith, and it and it's not. It's a very complex place, and and that's we need to under we need to understand that. And I, I think on the other hand too, I think China, I'm speaking more broadly again, that also doesn't necessarily understand how we work in Canada or how the United States works at the level of granularity that's that's needed. Um, so that I think. It's a great question because I think that's the starting point for why we have challenges. And there are differences. And I think one of the issues around this too is I think we in the West have wanted China as it as China has gone through this phenomenal growth to become more like us. Well, it's not. I'm sorry. It's not it's not. It's China in the in the sense of the, the civilization and the culture and and so forth and the differences and and so I think we need to just we, we, we need to have a more nuanced view about each other. Um, and we need to understand that there are differences and those differences probably won't go away on some dimensions, but there's a lot, there's commonalities on many fronts. But so, so I think that's the kind of the, at the starting point, I think where we have challenges and, and as we have this kind of 
power shift or at least the emergence of a, of a second superpower, you, we all need to kind of have a better understanding of, of, of what this place is like and how it works and what the differences are within the country and also between us and them, if, if you will. Absolutely. So I, I, I want to pick up on what you said, and, and notwithstanding that China is not monolithic and you have, you know, naturally you have the people and you have different geographies, but you have the sort of the central communist uh, government. And so, and how does the, the governing part, the governing body that, that rules China today, how do they view their role within the broader world? And, and the reason I'm asking that question, I mean, from what I can tell, most empires had distinct ambitions, right? Americans wanted to spread the democracy, European empires, or builders, um, or the empire builders were actually wanted to spread Christianity and, and access trade routes. As China emerges as that global superpower, what are their highest objectives? What are their really their ultimate goals? I, again, I don't want to feel like I know all the answers on, on this. So please just take that just with a grain of salt, what I say, but my, my, yeah. I, I think there's a number of, of uh, things that they want to achieve, but I think the core one is they is China wants to operate and run itself in the way it wants to without interference, right? The, the, there's a lot of um, you know desire to have, if, if you will, we, we have our model of how we want to work and how we grow and what our, you know, beliefs are and values in different dimensions and we want to be able to play an a, a, you know an important role um that like we have in the past 200 years ago um china was you know the dom 250 years ago the dominant economy um if you if you think about the scale and size of it so i think there's a, a, the biggest part is wanting to just be able to kind of do what they want and not and they're I think there's a lot of focus they have on the 14 countries that surround them right they care a lot about in particular Russia India uh, Myanmar you know the South China Sea the trade routes uh, where you know they, they worry about energy security food security that that I think is a big driver I don't I personally don't and there's people who have different views by the way who are deeper sinologist than me so I just I just want to make sure you you're, sure. I'm, I'm not don't have the answer if, if you will no, but I, no. I would just say that they're 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 not I don't think they want to be a hegemon I, I don't think they actually want to spread communism around the world as the as the system I, I don't think that's the approach mm -hmm. but what they want to do is not just be able to do what they want to do in their area and the way they want to do it does right. that does that yeah, make sense? Thanks. It makes perfect sense. I actually, there's a couple of questions that just came in via chat and I want to pose those. And this is actually related to something I was chatting with Jeff Immelt on, a former chairman of GE at the last week's Lunches with Legends. And we were talking about the increasing protectionism in the West, the proxy battles between the US and China around the world, and of course, recent acrimony around COVID-19 and what that's done to the US-China relationship. The question that came in is, given that the U.S. is Canada's largest trading partner and, you know, sort of, um, is, is, are Canadians m destined to be mired by the U.S.-China relationship? I mean, you were Trudeau's growth, uh, uh, Trudeau's chair for the Canadian Growth Council. Is it possible, based on your work there, is it possible to achieve economic growth in Canada without the U.S. as a cooperative partner? We're sort of wedged in between this battle. How do you see that playing out? What are your thoughts? What are you, what's the, the future look like for Canada? Well, I, I, I start from the fact that we're a, you know, we're a small trading nation um, and we have to trade, right? We do not have the domestic market uh, to, um, you know, to be, to be able to just focus on the domestic side. I mean, I, you know, if I think about Chongqing, which is a city near where I am today, um, it's it's greater areas. The size it's a city basically the size of Canada, right? It's it's got it's like 38 million people. That's a city here, yeah. um, and so we we have to trade. And the United States is an extremely important partner and will be. I don't I don't buy the U.S. is going to you know go off into the sunset. It's the decline of the West and the the U.S. is going to remain. I think a very very important superpower, a dynamic economy. We're going to have to continue to trade. We, it's essential. It's existential. But that said, we also have to be much more 
of a of a player in Asia writ large. That's the broader Asia, and China is very much at the center of that. So it's when I think about it in particular, it's China and Southeast Asia, and then I also think about Africa. I'm a I'm a big fan of Africa, as you know, and I and I that's not that's not in Horizon One, but it's in Horizon Two, and we better get working on it now because that's where the that's where a lot of the growth is going to be down the road. So I it's I think it's essential, and the Growth Council work we did. The, it, it was laid out very clearly. We had to weigh up our game in the Asian economy, and particularly with China. The idea that our second largest trading partner accounts for 4.8% of our exports, that's China, by the way, is not a very diversified strategy, number one. Yeah. Number two, it doesn't, the growth fundamentally, even though the US will remain a significant market. The growth, the dominant amount of growth, the center of the economic world, is sh- it has shifted. It's not going to. It has shifted to that broader region. So I think it's very important. And, and one thing I, I, I do worry about is I think we're, we haven't realized that as fast as we should have, if, if you will. It's happening at a speed and scale. And I'm sure there are many people on this you know, a, a call and, and Zoom who, who have even deeper perspective in terms of if you think about what I think about our pension funds and where they're investing. And it's a bit, they have to be, it's, it's a bit awkward for them to talk given our whole political condition about, yeah, we're going to increase our investments absolutely and proportionately, but that's what's happening. And mm-hmm. that's, that's good for Canadians. That's good for my retired parents who have nothing to do with China. They're going to benefit and they are from the growth in that region. Uh, so that I feel very strongly about our need to really significantly reallocate toward the region, and, and again understand that China is very much at the flywheel of what's happening uh, in that in that region, and then Africa. Yeah. So, and I'm going to get to Africa in a moment, but I just want to pick up on your retired parents and you know the Canadian pension plans. <laughs> you know, I. Um, as you know, most of the people on the call are allocators of capital, family offices private investors. Um, in your opinion, you know, what is the safest and most efficient way for investors to get exposure to China? And I know you're not a financial advisor, uh, but if you had to advise your brother, your sister, your mother, uh, how and where to invest in China, what would you tell them? Well, I think, for, first of all, I would, and again, you're exactly right, Lotus, I'm not an, an investor, so please be, <laughs> don't take everything I say with a a, a, a grain of salt. I, I um, give my money to others to manage, which is more <laughs> successful. But I, I would be looking for, in terms of weighting, w- the weight of the allocation, if you will, uh, to, I would be looking toward uh, several countries. I'd be looking toward China. I'd be looking towards Indonesia. Um, and I would be looking uh, towards Vietnam, because I just look at, I look at the underlying trends like the size and growth of the middle class. I look at urbanization. I look at the, the, the techno, the, the sort of the techno, technocracy, if you will, of the planning systems that are in those places. And I would be looking for companies, again, either they can be Western companies with a lot of exposure to those areas, right? I, that would be one. Um, by the way, Apple is what, you know, there's a number of, of, of kind of iconic American brands that are heavily focused in that. Um, but I would also be looking, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of private equity firms that are, have now been focused on Asia. And I would be looking, I would definitely be uh, looking at them, if you will, that are looking at, I'd be looking at venture capital in uh, China. And I don't want to sort of Say names because that's not appropriate. But there are names. There, there's some. I, you know, I was just in Shanghai yesterday. I will mention there's one a firm called M31 Capital. It stands for the Andromeda Galaxy. These, you know, you think about Hill House. I don't know if it's possible mm-hmm. to even invest in Hill House anymore, just given the performance that, that where they're taking any more money. But you know, these are. I would look at who they're in that. I, I would try and figure out and understand who is it that Hill House is invested in, and I would try and <laughs> invest. Uh, alongside uh, of them, but yeah. I, I think again, there's there's some very, I think, sophisticated, highly 
talented, globally minded, Asian focused private equity venture capital firms that I would be thinking hmm. uh, about putting a weight uh, more al allocation towards. Yeah, no, thank you. That's great. Um, so let's let's actually come back to Africa. You, you mentioned that a few minutes ago, and I know you have a personal connection to Africa. You were born, you're there, you're raised there until I think seven. I think you, I believe you built McKinsey's practice in Africa. And if I'm not mistaken, I think you headed President Obama's uh, Invest Africa initiative. I guess does Africa, what I'm struggling to, to uh, understand is does Africa have the potential to be that next frontier? Like, do you believe that it can rise above some of the systemic corruption issues and internal challenges? And, and what would it take to do that? Um, I, I do, in short, I, 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 I do. I think it is a very complicated place. As you said, there is corruption. Um, there's, there's, it, it's, um, there's always been the kind of the bold, you know, uh, you know, targets that have been set and they haven't always been, you know, haven't been fulfilled like they should. But I, so again, the way I look at Africa is to then break it down. It's a bit like Asia. Again, maybe I'm guilty of that saying Asia writ large. Well, it's not, it's not all of Asia. It's, it's, it's a focused set of countries. So I think about Africa as 10 countries. Hmm. Um, and that's where I would be focusing, you know, um, my, the efforts, because there is a lot of, uh, you know, corruption, there's bad governance, there's a lot of challenges in it. But I but I do think that there are parts of Africa where I would be focused. I think East Africa is a, you know, three or four countries in there. I, by the way, I'm still bullish on Ethiopia, even given what's happened today. I think even the people on the call have listened to Samir more than me on, on, on this one or ask him for advice. But I think there is a, if you, if you just, again, I look at a middle class, I look at infrastructure, I look at sort of long term policy making, um, and you just and, and the innovation that's actually going on on the technology front. Um, I think that there are opportunities. So I, I think there's 10 countries, I'd be looking at specific sectors. Um, you know, that, that like, I'd, I'd be looking at sectors like, you know, microfinance, I would be looking at, uh, you know, uh, healthcare, uh, basic Healthcare and there's a there's a lot of new technology developed in that actually in Asia that I think is very applicable to that. I think infrastructure. I know that's a, a quite a risky area that people would talk about, but I but I think that I think I think we're going to see much more happening on on that front. People looking for ways to de-risk it and allow private players to play more of a role. I, th um, I hope that our pension funds would play a role. They're not that excited about that. Like I would hope they are, but I think they can be if some of the risk mitigation things can be put in place. So I, again, I think there's focus on a few countries in there. Uh, think about the sectors where you're just going to see that you've got a tailwind, if you will, sure. on it. And education is another one, technology. And, and I think the thing is to begin to get be, begin to get engaged so you learn more about about where it is. It's, it's kind of, it, you know, it's always easier after the fact when you look at a market or a sector or a region. But I think that taking baby steps, getting learn, getting information, learning about it, I think is quite important. Mm -hmm. One one organization I spend a lot of time with, I just is um, the Oleon Group. I want you know it's a it's a you know family uh, driven business, a very successful business, and one of the reasons I enjoy working with them is their long-term perspective. I mean, they, they think in very long-term views and have a very interesting way of looking at these, the future, if you will, and where growth is and the fundamentals. Hmm. Um, so again, I think it's important. Africa is a long game. Like not, if you're not long-term, don't, don't, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but if you are thinking long-term, I would be taking the steps to get to know uh, know the place, and there there are some very good business leaders in there. And typically, good business leaders hang around with other good business leaders, so you can you you can find you you, you can find the organizations and the and and the companies that are that are there. Hmm. And, and let me just before we turn the conversation towards you know markets and some human capital and financial um, uh, financial services, 
I just want to state the obvious, like you've built these extraordinary relationships with people around the globe in wildly different cultures with very different value systems. You know, if I'm just curious, what, to what do you attribute your success in building those relationships? And more importantly, you know, what lessons or tools could all of us bring to bear in doing business or investing around the world? Well, you know, I, I think that, um, and this is probably so obvious, I'm embarrassed to say it, but, but I think, you, you know, it's if you really like people and being with people and kind of trying to meet different people, that there's an element of, you're not just looking for people like you or yourself, if you will, like looking in the mirror, you're, you actually enjoy it. I think that that's a mindset, if you will, of that, you're, of a appreciation that there, that people are different and fi- and, and kind of dig into it to understand it more and you're going to learn something and you'll get stimulated if you will. That's kind of my mindset with everyone. I look at you, Mo, I don't know, but I'd, I'd like to ask you a pile of questions. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm got a bunch of questions. I, so you, you get, you, so I think it's being curious about people. The other thing, I'm, I'm just going back to the question you asked me at the beginning on, you know, what, what helped me kind of move through life. And I mentioned the teachers and so forth. One, the other thing I have to tell you is it, it's not just different cultures, it's people from different places. And probably the best learning experience was my, my early jobs were just very heavy labor jobs. So I was a, I worked as a first mate on a salmon fishing boat off the West coast of, which is probably the hardest job I've ever done. Yeah. And th- there were pretty rough people that I was, you know, working with, you know, the captain was a guy who loved guns and loved to, shoot everything he possibly could including freighters so they were kind of not the normal people you'd be dealing with and then you'd meet sort of a group there were japanese fishermen that were the most organized i I wanted to stay on there but the food was good they planned everything then i worked in a sawmill in fort nelson and worked with a guy who changed his name from i won't say his name because he's I shouldn't identify, but he changed his name from a normal sort of a normal name to Zulu Khan. He was about a six foot nine guy with a beard and a, and he, he basically was a quite a rough, you know, he'd been arrested for shooting up cigarette machines with shotguns and, you know, all this stuff. And he was the shop steward. I'm telling you this story because what he, it turned, turned out we were having, we're on this night shift a friend of mine who was a university student was reading a Carl Sagan book. And this guy, Zulu Khan says with a, with a literally a grade four education, you know, what do you think about the book? And this friend of mine who was extraordinarily arrogant said, what would you know about a book on astronomy? Like something turns out Zulu Khan has read a lot about astronomy. Um, And he had a rough, you know, he's a rough, guy he's a he's a frightened but he was a really interesting person so this is another Canadian is a fellow Canadian who's just a bit different than who I would normally be (laughs) hanging out with and I I I really like this guy a lot like I love and he's just a different because he has he he's a fascinating person so I that to me is always the I'm very curious I I like and I think most of us are right And, and I think it's just not having a set view of this person is good or bad or, you know, smart or dumb or look, you, you got to spend it, listen and understand. And then you, when you get to see the person, you, there's a lot of amazing things. That's just my mindset. And I've, and I felt that again, whether it be working in Korea or China or India or, or kind of remote parts of Canada, or sometimes in a, very sophisticated Canadian company with very rough people too. You know what I mean? There's different, there's different types. So I I just, I'm not, I've always been fascinated with people, especially people that I I'm not familiar with. I find that it gives me energy. I don't know. I think I'm a weird guy that way, but that's kind of how I roll. Stay stay deeply curious, uh, deeply curious about other people. Uh, Yeah. So let me, let me turn the conversation to something perhaps a little bit more mundane, but you know, you've co-authored this book, which I think was fabulous. It's Dangerous Markets, Managing and Financial Crisis. Um, given the most recent uh, pandemic and COVID crises, are there any fundamental shifts that you see now in financial services or markets generally that investors need to be increasingly mindful of? 
Um, yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think the the obviously this massive amount of you know you know the stimulation that which thank God was done uh, after the the pandemic came in on the monetary side and the fiscal side. There's going to be consequences to that. I mean, I we're going to have to pay for it, and whether that's you know inflation or significant debt. You know, the the crises are typically. Uh, at least when we, I was studying them when we, it was right after the Asian financial crisis. And, I, and it was actually what I spent a lot of time in university looking at was, was financial crises. I'm a big fan of Hyman Minsky and his, you know, who, who would always, whenever a crisis occurred, he would write about it, but also go back, you keep going back in the past and you just see, we don't learn from these things, right? We don't, we just don't seem to learn. But tip, what, what, what you know, crises typically are, are are started by a policy move, which usually is for a good reason. You know, in Sweden, you know, there, there's the Scandinavian crisis that occurred, and that was that related to what was done to, you know, um, you know, liberalization of interest rates and, and encouraging mortgages. Right? They, these were good. They were the good things, but they have a. It's what's the second, third, fourth bounce of the ball when you do that, and mm-hmm. I think we've got a number of. Of, of bubbles, if you will, that are that are in the system that we've got to try and deal with. The two biggest are the is this you know the, the inflation, which we have, you know, you guys will know more much more than I will, but that's a I think that's a very significant one. The debt, um, you know, the, the fact that you know how are we going to pay for what we're doing? And again, I, I would argue what we're doing is right, but let's just recognize there's realities uh, to this. I think on the technology side too, there's there's bubbles within asset classes, if I could call it that, right? In terms of of where things are, um, and so what that I think it's just it, so the the risks, big risks are out there, and I think it's good to just be talking about them and then looking for the early signs of of where they may be, and that means you need to be talking with a lot of different people. So the you know there were. It, there were signs in in South Korea before the merchant bank started to to go down, the, or in Thailand with the, with the, again it typically started with the smaller banks. I'm watching very carefully while I'm here in China with the there's been again been regional and small bank failures. I I don't believe there will be a financial meltdown here, but I watch that because typically the it's not the big ones that drop first; it's little ones, and then the little right. ones create the the contagion. And I think that's we, I think that's true for other dimensions of the economy too, not just in bank in the financial system. Um, so, uh, I, I think I think it's uh, it's really important to be thinking about risk as much as there's growth. I'm more an optimist growth type of person, but I think you have to be always having a discipline of thinking of these what are the issues and talking to to people again with with kind of odd views different views yeah. Yeah. um not not the, not the regular views so so tying these together a little bit you know your discussion about curiosity and people and people with different views and i'm, I'm thinking right now about uh another one of your books talent wins the new playbook for putting people first and you know and and uh, naturally you ran a business that was almost entirely human capital driven so w- when you think about um the First of all, I'd be interested in what McKinsey did to develop its human capital um, and what practices your clients uh, found most effective in this domain, in other words, in, in developing the leaders. But when you're talking about leaders with different views, is there a specific kind of leadership that generates the highest ROI? Like what, what has been your experience in, in sort of talent selection and talent development? No, that's a, it's a great question. I'd you know, I, I think first of all on talent development, I, I think it's I, I really truly believe it's fundamental. And I, I really, you know, if you're in a mining company, or I, don't, I don't care what organization you're in, I think it has to be first and foremost because it's 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 leaders and people that actually are the ones that drive the capital decisions or make the decisions and so forth. They're there and in that book. That that was a result of. It's kind of, again, a slow learner like me, but after probably 30 years of working in McKinsey and working with a lot of organizations, it was just, it sort of whacked me on the head. And it, and it was a 
regular discussion that I would have with Rem Sharan, just saying, you know, what do you, it's again asking people, what do you see, what do you think the biggest bottlenecks are for organizations to be able to fulfill their potential and that type of thing. Um, so I, I think it's no matter what industry, what you do, talent is fundamental and leaders need to own it, if you will. It's not for the HR departments to figure out. And as I said, I think we've also denigrated or don't give the respect that we should to the HR department. Mm -hmm. and, and HR is not administration. It's about talent development. So I, I, I just, that's a very strong belief. I think on the leadership front, that's a very deep question. I I, and there's a lot of, there's certain, to me, basic levels of what you, you have to have someone who's got, in my view, you know, energy, ambition, um, the resilience, you know, the ability to kind of, because you're going to, with crises and mistakes, you're going to stumble, you got to just get right back up. So those are kind of, to me, those are table stakes. The distinguishing fact on leadership when I, when I've seen it, and I'm, I'm, I'm a student of leadership, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a, a leader, I'm a student of leadership, is watching is judgment. I think that's the fundamental judgment and values. And you see, because I think in increasingly significant leadership roles, the biggest challenge is you're making a lot of right versus right decisions. Like they're not, the easy decisions are when it's clear, like this, doing this is better than that. Well, what if, what if both decisions are right, but they actually you know, you, if you do one, you damage the other. There, there's more, there are cases like that more and more in this kind of world that's moving quickly. So judgment is really important. Is, is, is I think when I see the best leaders, you can just, it's almost like a nose. They've got a, they've, they've got this big nose that sort of smells where it is. They'll look at the numbers. They'll listen to people. They'll read things. They'll get it. But then you've got to make a call and there's, people are able to build that. Um, I, you know, I, I do think GE, I mean, with your Jeff email, I, I think GE built incredible leaders that way from, from you know, they, they weren't in the Ivy League schools. I think Jeff email was one of the only ones in the top 100, right? Is it, and you, but they are able to build that. And I think judgment comes from, it's a muscle. It's not, you don't have it or you don't, it's a muscle. And I think that's where you've got to put people in put young leaders and talent in uncomfortable places where they may not be ready, but right. like throw them in the swimming pool without knowing that they can swim. It can, that's going to sound pretty harsh, but I, when I look at McKinsey and the lead, the best leaders that I feel that we developed, they were typically people that were either thrown in a pool before they were ready, often because someone had left, you know, there was all of a sudden mm -hmm. there's no one there and you've got to be able to do it or they, they took risk, right? They took a big risk to kind of drive something and it, and it wasn't there. And through doing that over time, they build up that judgment and, and be, you know, it. like when you're with someone who's got a lot of judgment, it is one of the most pleasant things to be mm -hmm. with. It just feels good when, when you yeah. see that. So there's some basics. Mm -hmm. And then I think I go to judgment. And and what is it that when you see and you've interacted with a lot of exceptional leaders, what what are some of the most common mistakes that you will see even exceptional leaders make? Um, there, there's a number of, of things. One is um, uh, is self selfishness. Uh, you just become you think you're really good. Um, you don't really have a time for a lot of other people and you actually become strangely enough, the more successful you get, the more kind of obsessed you get with being recognized for being successful or what, you know what I mean? So I think selfishness and that, that's usual stuff, you know, pride, if I, if I could call it that to be there. I think that's, that's, that's a dimension of that. I, I just title it selfishness and you, right. and you, and you can see it. I think the second uh, one is actually managing your energy. I, I think leaders find it's diff, very difficult to manage your time as a leader because there's just so much stuff coming onto your plate. So what you really have to do is manage your energy. And by, by that, what I mean is that, you know, some every during any one particular type of day, you would have, there's, some, there's issues or people that will suck energy from you. 
right? You just, they just, they, they, it's like a vacuum cleaner coming into a room. And if you're dealing with a, a, a challenging time and you are, don't have a lot of energy, you can't absorb issues and then you might make a mistake. One, one example I've given of me many times of me doing this, I'm, I'll never forget a trip. If it, tell me to shut up, Mo, if I'm talking oh, too much, too, by the way, because I don't want, is it? Okay. So the story I'll just give you is I, I was, um, you know, I was traveling a lot when I was the managing partner. I was probably traveling 300 days of the year. In fact, people would sort of say, like, where do you live? I was sort of given altitude, not a geography, <laughs> because I was just flying around. So I'm doing all this stuff. And I, I was in Thailand. I was really, t- I'd, been, I'd been really traveling a lot. And um, I didn't know how to, you know, I, I was tired. I hadn't done any exercise. I sort of flew in and we were meeting the, the, the the sort of the head of the education department, let's say like a minister. This was after the army had taken over. And this person was one of the most arrogant people I've met. Like just on sort of said, started off by saying, you know, I moved from the UK because I was, you know, to do this because people don't know what they're doing here. And I made this, he just sort of went on about himself. It was more to say, and he was talking and, and he wanted to meet me, right? I wasn't trying to meet him. He wanted... And then he went on and he started talking about McKinsey and how useless basically McKinsey was on some projects that had been done. And, you know, I'm not sure you guys know how to turn a light bulb on. If you heard the joke, like literally saying this, and I was, <laughs> I was tired. I had no absorption. So I literally just put my hand up, um, like in a timeout. I mean, if you can see it on the screen, mm-hmm. and the guy was a bit shocked because he was very formal. He said, like he was, it was, I interrupted him and I, and I said, I've got to, I have, I have to ask you a question right now how do you think this meeting is going? Right. And, and the guy was like, he was a bit shocked, right. And his chief of staff as well. Look at me. He said, well, I'm, you know, we're talking about this. And I said, well, can I give you my view of that? And he said, sure. And I said, I think this meeting is going very badly. I said, I've never been so irritated in my life. You've asked me to come here to talk about this. All you've done is drone on and you've insulted me and I'm actually not that interested in hearing more of what you have to say. And my colleague was literally punching my legs, like, shut up, <laughs> don't like you've lost it. And I have to say, the look on this person's face, he was totally shocked. I felt good for a, like a minute. I was going, I'm not going to take this. I felt, and then two hours later, I felt so badly because here I am coming, you know, this person now is going, I've met one of the most arrogant crazy guys from McKinsey you can believe he shut down them you know what I mean I and it what it felt good but it was bad if, 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 if you know what I mean yeah. and, and that's when you're tired you do that stuff and you make you, you make you're sloppy you get yourself into trouble um you know and and you and there's lots of there's lots of things to tempt you right there's a whole Dan Vasella has got a whole who's at Novartis his whole thing on temptation and i mean that in the, its broadest sense sure. and so i think you better as a leader be centered and, and have your energy managed and, and so forth as, as you go through it so anyhow those are sorry for the, the sidebar no, that's, this is, those are this is, some things yeah. it's actually great and it made me think a little bit about the fact that um first of all most of the people on the line are families um and you know you've obviously dealt with major public companies, governments, but you've also dealt with family businesses and family offices. And I know you said on the board of at least one. Um, so how do you think some of these approaches translate into a sort of a business family context or a family succession context? Um, and the talent development side of the equation in that, what unique elements should families be thinking about that perhaps you know, a public company CEO may not care about or or vice versa well i think um maybe a couple of things i'd say about that it, because that's obviously a very deep area too right it, it is that you guys know, know a lot about but is uh i think there's a lot of um you know common things that in a publicly listed company and a fact you know in terms of leadership and setting goals and being long term and all that are very similar like I don't you need to have good leadership and so forth I think the tensions in a couple of others is one is I think family businesses can have an advantage in terms of their time frame what I love about family businesses they're long term that is a huge competitive advantage in my view if you can 
if you really are thinking about this as multi generational, it, mm-hmm. it's personal, if you know what I mean. And that there's nothing, there's nothing as powerful as a family long term business compared to any, you know, even more so I'd argue than a pension fund. It's mm-hmm. personal. And I think that's an, think about that as an advantage. I think the tension on the other side is, you know, it's, you know, when it's family, it's awkward to be as brutal as one might be in a public company. If, you know, Johnny is not cut out for doing a particular part of a role and his younger sister is on that, that, that's in any, when you, you mix sort of the, that you mix that up, if you will, it's awkward mm-hmm. by definition. I, I don't, I've not met a family over the long term that's been able to deal with that in a cold heart, like there's a, it's emotional, right? So we just have to realize that. So what's the mechanism by which you deal with it? Because you, it's got to be meritocratic in my view. You, you, if you want a long-term organization and you think about talent, meritocracy matters. So how do you, do that in a way that is appropriate in a in, in a family, and I think there's a lot of very interesting models out there that are, and other people are much more expert in it. But I, I, you know, but I, I all I can tell you is I love working with family. You know, as you mentioned, I, you know, I was an Oleon. I love working with them because of the family, and it had all the. I would say that they're interesting. They're an interesting family. My brothers and sisters, and I look at the Wallenberg, you know, investor which I think is a very, very sophisticated investor, long-term, done a lot for Sweden. I, I, I'd love to be a part of that family. I, I can't, you know, that's where I just, I wish I could be part, you know, cause it's, they, but they, there's tough stuff that's, that's done that. So I, but I think you've got, got to be clear eyed about the uh, challenges of it. And I think the emotional side and how people participate in the business or not, how decisions are made about whether people do it or not, and then how do you keep the other aspects of the of the family dimension in there is different. But it, but I think it's very important to again do that in a very explicit mm-hmm. way versus implicit way. I think I my personal view is that when you are implicit about things, hope because you don't really want to have the that you end up in a place you might not want to be, or you go into some cul-de-sac from time to time. So it's great. So Tom, I just, I know we have uh, virtually no time, but I just want to squeeze in one last question. And, you know, for your entire career, uh, countless people have been leaning on you to look around corners, see what's over the horizon. Um, When you think about what excites you most about the future and what you're most scared about, about the future, are there any contrarian views that you hold? Um, uh, and if not, just maybe just that answer in itself. What what scares you most about the future, and what are you most excited about? And take a ten year time frame. That's, easy. that's a great. Yeah, that, you know, I I'm, um, I'm I'm again I'm an optimist, so I'm I'm gen you know generally and genuinely sort of excited about, and I'm I'm actually get excited by change, if you know what I mean. So I just am, fascinated with the technology uh, shifts that are going on and the opportunities that that creates to be for for individuals, the, the individual to actually be able to build something more substantive than they ever have. And I, I look at a, a person like Elon Musk, it's, it's just amazing. He may be a bit different, but you and, and and he probably he probably wouldn't want to hang around with me that's for sure i'm not sure i would want to be on vacation with him but you someone who's kind of disrupting the planet one person it's pretty remarkable right to sort of and i think that we're in more of a world like that where there, there can be some incredibly productive disruption so that exci- and i think again we haven't even turned the first corner on the technology side so i'm very excited by by that i'm excited by this kind of we're, we're moving into a new geopolitical world. I'm actually quite excited by that. I think it's it's good to have change in 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 ways. I'm you know I think that I'm a fan of the Chinese culture of the of the Indian culture. If one can even say there's one Indian, and I want to be careful about being a monolith there. But you know what I mean. There's different yep. than what's happening with Africa. It's going to create a lot of 
opportunities. We're going to be broader minded people and all of that. My biggest fear is actually the process of how we kind of go through all this change. And it's, it's some mistakes, some basic, simple mistakes that will get us into a major crisis. So I'm concerned, obviously, about the tensions between China and the United States because they're, they're pretty rough and COVID has made it worse because you can't get together physically, mm-hmm. you know, to be able to talk and, you know, hear, understand each other and all of that. And so the social capital that's in the world right now is pretty thin because we're not spending a lot of time together. We're not working on as much stuff as we should be together. And so if a mistake occurs, which it inevitably will, it it will, like a a U.S. naval boat runs over a Chinese coast guard by by mistake, totally, you know, there's there's a lot of traffic Mm -hmm. going on. And that that could blow out, right? You, I, I, you you go back to the kind of World War One, you know, story, and there's a lot being written about it. Again, I'm not forecasting war. I'm, I'm forecasting, or I'm, I'm worried about mistakes that will get us into a place that we don't want to be to. And what worries me is we kind of we sort of know that, but we're not really working on it. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. This is where I think leadership's needed. We've got to. We've got. If we don't do it, no one's going to do it. That's the other thing I'm sort of real. Like we've all got to get in in the mix we've all got to get into the arena right. and and we've got to start working on a on a, on the corners of the box that we're working in because they're not working so well so i'm kind of torn between this optimism excitement curiosity change which i think is healthy i think what you 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 know you grow you're growing or you're dying and i think you grow during change but i there's so much volatility and given the conditions we're you know with now without the communication and, and so forth that we uh and a media that's very different and so forth that we could end up you know blowing ourselves up on uh, because of mistakes um and that's what that's so that's where i'm i don't know what type of risk i would call that mo like i don't you know it's not i'm tail with i don't know what it is but it's mm-hmm. it's just something that i yeah. I, I worry about. And the last thing I just say is I do think our, if I look at other times of massive change in our history, and I'm, one area I'd look at is around the late 1700s. If you just think about the amount of change that's going on geopolitically from democracy, you, you know, um, technology, it was actually a lot of philosophy that was there as well to help us understand how this works. And that's a part I feel that's missing. The kind of maybe it's the spiritual or the philosophy, whatever you want to call it. it the rest is is racing so far ahead of that that we're have we really absorbed what this means, right, and where it is? And so um, it's made me want to, you know, sponsor back people who are are think are philosophers. Actually, it sounds mm-hmm. like maybe a strange thing to do, but how do we kind of make sense of this? Not the forces at work, but kind of how it shifts. So that's that's yeah. it's just an inkling. I don't yeah. maybe complete. Maybe I should just go to bed and shut up. But that's sort of what that's something that worries me. Yeah, no, Dominic. First of all, that was both fascinating and fantastic. And I I can't thank you enough for joining us today and uh, really sharing your incredible insights with us. I can't tell you how much we appreciate your generosity of time and wisdom, especially since it's past one thirty. AM in the morning, you know, in China. Uh, and we we really hope that we can do this again. Um, so thank you. And for all our participants, thank you for joining us. If you have not yet donated, please do so by going to the donate page at the top right of the site so that we continue to strengthen uh, pediatric mental health in our communities. Dominic, thanks again for your support of Lunches with Legends. We are so grateful for your participation and wishing you and everyone on the call a wonderful day. Thank you. 